Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Mike Trigg, coming out of the the uh, Silicon Valley Bay Area, and he's going to talk to us all about tech entrepreneurship. I love having guests such as Mike shed some light on this kind of this very niche and very vibrant ecosystem that's created some of the most world's most valuable companies, most valuable ideas, all the innovation. Uh, and I'm really happy to introduce him to the show to the guests. So, Mike, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I know you've uh, written a book. We'll talk about that, BitFlip, and you've got, done so much work. Kind of set the stage and talk about your early career days and how it led to what you're doing today. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I'm a Wisconsin native. Um, went to uh, Northwestern University for undergrad, uh, then went to Washington, D.C., and the first career that I thought I wanted to pursue was uh, politics. <laughs> so I worked on Capitol Hill for a few years. Uh, it was an interesting time to work on Capitol Hill. Um, and then uh, kind of got the entrepreneurial bug. I had, you know, out in D.C., I was reading about this wonky thing called the Information Superhighway. This was back in the early 90s. And I thought, wow, this seems like it could be a, a once in a generation transformational technology. Um, and so I set my sights on getting out to California with the dot com boom. I uh, came out here for business school at UC Berkeley, which was wonderful. Uh, and then uh, pursued a career in technology. I was in the uh, tech industry for over 20 years um, uh, uh, in just about every capacity and every type of company. I did hardware and software. I did enterprise. I did consumer. Uh, I did very large companies and I did, I founded companies and co-founded companies and, and uh, more, you know, further in my career, invested in companies. So I've I've kind of done a wide range of stuff in Silicon Valley. Um, and then it was during COVID, actually, I'd always had this aspiration since undergrad to uh, write a novel. And I was trying to do it on nights and weekends, and I wasn't having a lot of success getting it done. It takes a lot more time and effort than you expect. And um, I'd been working on a startup during COVID that, you know, we, we weren't able to raise additional funding. So I we wound that down. And I thought, hey, if I'm ever going to take a shot at being a full-time writer, now's the time to do it. So my first book uh, called BitFlip, which I can talk more about what that title means, but uh, came out in fall of 20. Um, it was, you know, a little bit of introspection. It was, you know, kind of write what you know. I, it was about an executive at a tech company who discovers potential fraud within the organization and sort of what to do about that. So kind of a cautionary tale and a critique of um, Silicon Valley tech culture. So, and then I, my my second novel uh, called Burner is coming out this spring. So that's that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, I love that. And we're, we're gonna talk about how you, um, you know, why um, you chose writing as a medium, which is, um, I love this. I have a colleague, Deborah Blaine. She's actually, she writes fiction, but she tries to incorporate kind of um, narratives within the stories to kind of highlight yep. problems with healthcare, which, um, but uh, what's really interesting to me is um, this area of Silicon Valley. And it's, um, like I said, it's it's got, it's so much innovation, but it's also got a lot of um, controversy. So, you know, we'll talk about kind of, um, this, you know, this area of VC, and um, we have this idea of tech exploitation, and you got social media, yeah. and then AI. Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, that really has become my area of interest and sort of my, my lane, if you will, for being a writer is, um, you know, all my books have a common theme, which is the impact of technology on modern life. Um, and so the first book, really examine that from the standpoint of a technology company. And, uh, you know, there's, there is a tendency, I think maybe this has diminished somewhat in the last few years, but a tendency to sort of glorify tech companies, you know, there's this great American entrepreneurial dream about, you know, founding a company. And if you look at the most valuable companies in the world, you know, they're almost all technology companies that started in a garage. Uh, so there's a great sort of mythos about that, uh, but the reality can be you know a lot different. I, I was I I've founded or co-founded a number of companies and been a, an executive at other early stage companies, and you know the path is rarely a linear one. Um, there's a lot of uh, challenges along the way. 
Uh, I've had companies that have been very successful and had lucrative exits, but I've had companies that have struggled. I've had companies that have pivoted. I've had companies that I've had to shut down. What I kind of came to realize and what this first book, BitFlip, is about is uh, there are some, I think, structural challenges to how venture-backed companies are formed, how their uh, their sort of governing structure that can make them a little susceptible to uh, misdeeds if they're if if everybody within the business isn't operating with a high degree of integrity. And you know, you, we certainly have seen some notable examples. One in the healthcare space with Theranos, obviously, was a a giant fraud. Basically, at the end of the day, uh, FTX, the cryptocurrency company that imploded uh, spectacularly. You know, there have been some pretty high profile examples as, you know, sort of the 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 economy slowed and the tech economy in particular slowed. Lowering tide sort of exposes some of the uh, misdeeds that are going on. So uh, that was really what the, the book was about. And the title, uh, for those of you, you know, with a technical background, you'll know a bit is expressed in binary code as either a zero or a one. It can only be <laughs> one of two things. And when a bit changes from zero to one, it's called that's called a bit flip. And so I use that title to metaphorically refer to sort of a change of heart that I had as an author and that the protagonist goes through in the story. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. I was going to mention Theranos and, you know, Sam Bankman fried and his family. And um, the other question is, you know, there's also data, there's privacy, um, there's the impact of social media on mental health. You know, all these yeah. things and um you know it seems like silicon valley is undergoing like this identity crisis there was this recent criticism of venture capitalists kind of just pumping things and then dumping it onto and then so um you know kind of talk about the understanding the negative externalities of the tech industry from a tech insider um you know with this identity crisis uh, what problems need to be solved because you know a lot of founders are now founding companies outside of the united states because it's more friendly or yeah well the origin story of Silicon Valley with companies like HP and Apple, probably most notably, is this sort of uh, progressive, do-good thing, right? The, 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 uh, the message here was we're making the world a better place, that technology is only good. Um, it doesn't have any of the negative externalities of, you know, the banking industry or the oil and gas industry or sort of other you know, old old school generation products that pollute and everything else. And oh, that was a very powerful appeal of the area. You know, that was a part of the reason I came here. It was one of the few places where you felt like you could get rich and not get a guilty conscience over it, right? Like that you deserved those rewards. And I think it's really just been in the last, you know, decade or in, and even more concentrated probably um, post-pandemic you know, you see this term big tech, like big oil or big pharma start to be used. Um, you start to see a, a more widespread awareness among the general public of the negative effects of some of these technologies, the power that some of these tech giants wield, and, you know, a recognition that, it, frankly, a cynicism within um, a lot of tech employees of, gosh, maybe I'm not making the world a better place. You know, if I'm at Facebook or Twitter and some of these platforms have been used to spread disinformation, to spread, spread hate speech, you know, there, there's uh, an increased sense and sensibility that, you know, it's not necessarily all good. Um, and here in the Bay Area, you see obviously very acutely, um, you know, the wealth stratification and gentrification that's happened as a result of the tech industry. You know, you kind of have areas of the city that are really struggling uh, with unhoused populations and and drug epidemics and other kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then a, a completely different class of workers living in luxury condos and, and you know, bus to work and, and fed and everything else. And so that, I think, is weighed on the conscience of a lot of people in the tech sector. Um, and, you know, then kind of compounding it, we saw a number of scandals. You touched on a couple, FTX, Theranos, there's a bunch of others. I did a post on my website at miketrig.com that um, spelled out, you know, the top 10, my, my take on the top 10 tech scandals of 2022. This was last year that I wrote it. And that article just took off. I mean, it's gotten thousands and thousands of reads. 
um, because it's a topic that people care about and they and they feel like the deck is a little bit uh, unfairly stacked, um, maybe against people who aren't in the tech industry. Yeah, and uh, what which I wanted to kind of touch upon, um, and there was actually because my friends they worked in Silicon Valley for during the early tech booms, and they were telling me that they uh, a lot of them uh, lived. In, there was a trailer parks, you know, people making six figures living in trailer parks or living on campus to save money on rent because the rent was just so sky high. Uh, yeah. people, like Google engineers and Meta engineers and Apple is like it was, and then have to like bike or take the bus to work and just kind of like very like struggling to make ends meet. So for somebody in the tech <laughs> industry earning a tech <laughs> industry salary, yeah, you know, imagine what it's like for a nurse or a teacher or a fast food worker. You know, th those occupations don't uh, earn nearly uh, the six figure salaries that that a lot of people in the tech industry earn. So it's visible here in the Bay Area. You see that dichotomy. Um, and that that was another big point of the book as well is, uh, you know, sort of examining wealth, um, you know, discrepancies. Yeah. Which leads me to my next question. And, you know, you know, we touched, for example, um, why do you think Silicon Valley is very particularly prone to white collar crime, uh, corporate malfeasance and uh, just white collar fraud? Yeah, let me be clear. It's not particularly prone to it. I mean, the vast, vast, vast majority of um, companies and people in the tech industry are, you know, beyond reproach, completely ethical. I never have witnessed anything that I would consider to be unethical or, or immoral, or let alone illegal behavior in any of the companies that I've ever been at. Mm. Um, so I don't want to suggest that it's widespread. <laughs> But you do see, you know, again, several dozen high profile companies that have ha had these sorts of struggles. I think it comes down to a, a handful of things. I think one big one is just the money at stake, right? That there's a large amount of capital that has flown into the venture investment, you know, sector uh, that those venture firms need to put to use and um, valuations sort of have gone very high. And, you know, I think founders can get into a mindset where they want to chase this paper valuation of their business. They sort of fail to, you know, recognize that that doesn't really mean anything. It's just a number on paper initially. Um, and then if the business can sort of start to go sideways or not perform as, as expected to justify those valuations, that's where sometimes you can see this sort of gap form. And it's an interesting dynamic. Like if you think about the board structure of a normal company, mm -hmm. the the governance, the board is there to oversee the CEO and to you know run things like audits of the financials and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, in venture backed companies, that sort of division of labor isn't always necessarily there, right? The uh, the venture investors invest very early. They're as much a, as deeply engaged in the company as the founder him or herself. Mm -hmm. And they want the company to succeed very badly as well. And so that can lead to, you know, there's a phrase for it, right? That entrepreneurs and, and others use of fake it till you make it, you know, <laughs> the, the notion that, hey, you know, uh, present your company in the best light possible. Um, show us why it's going to change the world. Show us why it's, us why it's going to be the next Google or Facebook. Um, and so for a founder, and I've been the founder in this position oftentimes, you're you're living in this world of hype that uh, about what your company is and what it can do. And it can become easy to kind of become untethered from the reality, right? And so I think that's one of the most susceptible areas, especially for a younger entrepreneur who doesn't have that experience, doesn't uh, maybe have their sort of uh, moral barometer as well tuned as somebody who's been doing it for a longer period of time. Um, that's where I think companies can get into a little bit of trouble where they, you know, first start to, you know, op optimally state, then they start to exaggerate, then they, you know, and pretty soon all of a sudden, uh Oh, you know, I, I, this is outright fraud. And then, you know, in the, the most, uh, catastrophic examples, they try to sort of cover up that fraud or they do per perpetrate greater and greater frauds to sort of cover up um, the malfeasances that have happened. And th those are, you know, well-documented cases and, and um, tremendously challenging ones uh, because, 
you know, that's really when the optical illusion bursts for the employees, the investors, any customers, et cetera, yeah. when they realize, you know, they've been, they've been misled. And especially with technology and innovation, it's so dynamic and it's so just very volatile. Things change, can change on a dime. You know, information is now moving at Twitter, which uh, because, you know, this conversation is all about kind of um, the hidden side of Silicon Valley. And I, and I encourage the audience to check out uh, Mike's book, BitFlip. It's on Amazon. Um, it's really in interesting. But um AI is the talk now these days, and you're seeing these yeah. companies with these massive valuations like NVIDIA and uh, just like Palantir and like just all that. I'm just like, wow, look at these valuations. I'm like, what is you like? What is the dark side of AI in Silicon Valley, especially because now we've got like a really important year. It's like elections and like there's all this misinformation and people can create deep fakes. And, you know, uh, even yeah. Tucker Carlson's, you know, going to interview P Putin. That's going to be really interesting. So what are your thoughts? Uh, wow, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I, I think first I would point to AI as a sector, as an investment sector. I think that we're seeing in that segment of the tech market um, an example of this sort of over exuberance or bubble or whatever you want to call it that can lead to these sorts of problems, right? You, you know, normally a venture investor um, or any investor is going to do their due diligence about a company, right? And so they're they're going to interview customers and they're going to audit financials and they're going to ask a bunch of questions of the founders and really get a sense of what it is that they're investing in. When there's a ton of hype uh, around a sector and many uh, potential investors throwing money at you know some of these AI companies, that's when this sort of feeding frenzy kicks in and yeah. the diligence is less because they, they feel like they need to move fast. They throw more and more money uh, to try and get their uh, investment offer accepted. Um, and so, you know, that's when corners are cut. That can lead to retrenchment. Um, what feeds it, of course, is everybody sees this as sort of a zero-sum game. I think in almost every tech sector, it's, it's really kind of a lion's share business, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. in most spaces of tech, the the number one company gets, you know, 80% of the market share, the number two maybe gets 10%, and then three through 50, you know, split the table scraps that are left. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's what creates this urgency to move fast, break things as the motto goes. So that's sort of, I think, an interesting, timely, happening right now, repeat of the mistake I don't know how you fix it because it's sort of, it's the nature of supply and demand. There's more, uh, you know, demand for these types of deals than there are uh, good, credible, you know, well, well uh, experienced entrepreneurs who are founding AI companies. Yeah. Um, in terms of the second part of your question, sort of touched on AI's impact on, you know, humanity sort of and, <laughs> and current events. I think it's, very concerning. I think that many technologies have to live through a major exploitation before the general public sort of becomes wary of them. Uh, we saw that sort of happen in social media in the 2016 election, you know, where it was like, well, wait, you mean everything I read on Twitter and Facebook isn't necessarily true and that there's bots and misinformation being spread and everything else. And, um, you know, I think, you know, now we're, we as internet consumers are a little bit more savvy about those things. Um, AI will be abused. It will, it is being abused right now. Um, it will be abused in the context of the 2024 election. Uh, I guarantee it. Um, and hopefully it doesn't require a massive scandal, uh, that isn't understood until hindsight. Um, hopefully we can be savvy about, you know, things like deep fakes and other s sorts of stuff that you mentioned. The pernicious side effect of all that is it starts to make us lose our faith in, you know, what's real a little bit, like lose our trust. Um, you know, if you reach a point where you feel like everything could be a scam or a lie or a cheat, um, that is very corrosive to, you know, sort of the the fabric of society uh, and business in particular, right? Trust, business yeah. needs trust to thrive. 
uh, and without trust, it becomes uh, very difficult to do business. So <laughs> I worry a lot about those things. And, and I worry about it in my profession in particular as an author, you know, generative AI programs like ChatGPT are indisputably right now changing the industry, right? I mean, there's a lot of worry about it, you know, creating uh, everything from plagiarized work to using copyrighted, you know, authors' copyrighted work as um, training data for these uh, large language models and putting writers out of jobs because it, it can generate uh, text. So I think writers, like every sector in the economy, will have to sort of adjust to those new realities that AI is bringing fast. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting because um, it's almost like I was talking to another um, tech entrepreneur and and he was saying that uh, AI is like being handed a golden ticket because now if you know how to use AI, you have such a huge advantage because think about it, if you have like autonomous driving vehicles or the, ro the robots are going to replace the servers and like, so it's just going to widen the wealth gap. And like, what, how are these people going to make a living now? Now you I was, a, I was a history major. And <laughs> so I do tend to take the long view on that kind of question that what increases our standard of living is improved productivity, right? And so people have had this worry about technology since, you know, fire and the wheel, right? You know, it's going to put me out of a job, you know, <laughs> I'm the scribe and now there's a printing press, you know, that's going to put me out of a job. Um, and, you know, generally speaking for humanity, um, this is good, right? The more productive we are, the higher our, our wealth as, as a, a, you know, from a macroeconomic sense, um, the more freedom we have to do other things. Individually, it might mean I can no longer be, you know, whatever, a carpenter or a farmer or whatever. And, and so we need to up-level, you know, uh, get better education so that we can pursue things that computers still can't do. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this lingering, unanswerable question of whether AI is going to sort of be the end of that trend, right? It's one thing to automate you know, manufacturing in a factory, it's another thing to have AI that its true promise is it is self-learning, that it that it, you don't need to train it anymore to do function X as you would a robot or other machinery uh, or other automation. You know, if it truly becomes you know, autonomous, <laughs> it starts to teach itself how to do everything. And that's where you get the Terminator movies and everything <laughs> else, right? Like, how far does that go? Uh, I'm not. I am not a doomsayer about AI. I I I think that its benefits will far outweigh the 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 risks and the the adverse effects. Yeah. But I think w we in the industry and we as a society are smart to try to really mitigate those side effects or, and be aware of them early. I mean, you saw a number of tech leaders last year signed an open letter to Congress at calling for, you know, <laughs> talking about AI as an existential threat to the human human species. Yeah. You know, that's unnerving. And what's happened since then? No, <laughs> practically nothing. You know, so all those companies that signed that letter have gone full steam ahead because they don't want to be the one that's left behind and, and shut out from the yeah. riches of this industry. So um, I do think that you know, if it's a race between tech and, you know, government bureaucracy, unfortunately, tech always goes faster. Uh, it usually has to get out in front and break things as the <laughs> motto goes before we, in hindsight, say, oh, okay, yeah, maybe we should, you know, not allow this, not allow that, regulate it in some ways. So we'll yes. see. Yeah. How can people find out more about you? Well, all the information about me is on my website. It's easy to remember, Mike Trigg with two Gs.com. Um, you can buy my books on, as you mentioned, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, most bookstores carry it in their, at least in their online version. Uh, my new book is called burner. It's more of a political thriller. Uh, and that comes out in April, uh, and is available for pre-order now. So, um, awesome. and then I, I'm quite active on my blog, on, on my website. I keep a blog. Uh, I have a newsletter, so I opine about all these subjects. Yeah. Uh, and there's a bunch of articles on there today that you can. All, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. We could go on forever because I love just talking about the implications about of tech, you know, and uh, it's really 
the way things uh, change is so fast. Um, for all the audience out there, be sure to check out Mike's resources. They'll be in the links and show notes. Give him a like and follow as well as his book, Amazon. And with that, thanks so much for a fascinating conversation. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.